Good evening. At this time, I'd like to call a regular meeting of Wallingford Inland Wetlands Watercourse Commission to order. The date is October 7th, 2020, and the time is 7.03. Will you join me in a pledge of allegiance to the flag? Roll call. Eileen McKean. Nick Kern. Jim Vitale. Deborah Phillips. Jennifer Passaretti. Okay. Erin O'Hare, Environmental Planner. Um, right. Before I go on any further, there's a, a new rule and a new improved rule regarding the protocol for this COVID virus uh, presentation. I'll read this from the Corporate Council Town of Wally for Janice Small. This is in direct consultation with Steve Civitelli, the town health director. All attendees, board members, and public shall wear a mask. Only persons who have written authorizations from a medical provider, which must be available for inspection, exempting them from wearing a mask, are allowed not to wear a mask. Any person authorized not to wear a mask must retain at least six feet from every other person. If a person refuses to wear a mask or follows instruction, to, to direct them to leave the meeting. If they refuse, call the police. Number two, practice six feet social distancing. Board members should consider changing their seats arrangements to provide distancing. If you change the seating arrangement, make sure the members speak into the microphone. They do not need to be on camera. They, however, must be part of the recording. Touchless hand sanitizer devices are located throughout the building for public use. The attendee should be reminded of the mask requirement. Advise individuals to distance themselves six feet from other attendees. Attendees residing within the same household are not required to provide social distancing. For your information, the ventilation system has been maximized to increase circulation of outdoor air in the town hall. As of March 18, 2020, there are increasing cleanings throughout the building focusing on high touch area. The health department is continually monitoring the pandemic as it relates to community and county case levels. You will be advised of any changes to the guidance provided herein. Chairperson shall consult with staff regarding the upcoming agenda and expect turnout by the public. While no one can know for sure how many people will attend, you should have a general idea. If there are concerns that a large number of people may attend, staff should look into moving the meeting into a larger location. This should be addressed prior to posting the meeting. Generally, the town council chambers have been more than adequate to accommodate the public. If the chairman has any questions, reach out to your staff, the health director, Steve Seventelli, or corporate council, Janice Small. Signed by Janice Small, corporate council. Okay, at the moment everyone is abiding by the request and the guidelines. Okay, moving on to uh, consideration of minutes. Is there uh, any comments regarding the minutes of the last meeting? If not, uh, I'll approve, entertain a motion to approve. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that the minutes of the meeting of um, September 2nd, 2020, be approved as submitted. Is there a second? Second. Motion made and second. Any discussion? Call for a vote. Allie? Yes. Nick? Yes. Debbie? Yes. Yes. Jennifer. Okay, old business. A18 1.2, 801 North Colony, ready for a bond release? No, they're not okay. ready for bond release. Okay, number two, A20, 6.7, 17, Fritz Place. John Rickey. Uh, Jim Ritchie, I'm a uh, microphone. Uh, my name is Jim Ritchie. I'm oh, Jim. taking the place of my brother, John. Okay. Speaking on behalf of my mom from 17, Fritz Place. Okay, Aaron, we uh, requested that they lay on a print what they were going to do in regards to this project. 
and I, I'm sure you've reviewed it. Any issues with it? Well, it let me just say that the, um, the print went out in the packet you received Friday night. I did not write an environmental planner's report because it's so short. Um, there's really no issue. The in, I did send out a copy of the town engineer's comments, but today she talked to the engineer working on the project and she cleared some things up. So now she's okay with it. So I really only have, well, maybe the owner wants to speak, but I really have only one comment on this. Now that the engineer said it will function, we, I wanted to get that from her. The one change we agreed on, and I, I don't know if Mr. Ritchie has heard this yet, but is just to make the, this is a 64 foot long swale, essentially, with stone in it. Um, is to make the side of the 64 feet that's closer to the river higher than the side that's closer to their backyard. In other words, when it fills up, I don't want it to spill out on both sides. I want it to just spill out on the south side toward the center of their yard. See, right now in the little drawing, it's even. In the detailed drawing, it's even across. And it's got to be a little higher on the... Um, Riverside. Is that a problem? No, that's correct. I brought that up to her attention when we met last week. Commissioners, any comments? Allie? No. Nick? No, I'm good. Debbie? No. Jen? I'm good. Okay, then I'll entertain a motion regarding significant activity. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that application A20-6.7, 17 Fritz, Fritz Place, be declared not a significant activity. Is there a second? Second. Motion made and second. Any discussion? Jennifer, I'll start with you. Uh, are we voting? No, we're voting if it's significant activity. Yes. The motion made. The motion was made to determine it was not a significant activity. Yes. So it's yes. Debbie? Yes. Nick? Yes. Allie? Yes. Yes. You're all set. Thank you for your much. Thank you for your oh, we have, we have a motion to approve. Oh. Well, that's half your all. <laughs> yeah, you're all set halfway there. <laughs> Jennifer got me all kind of messed up a little bit. Now I'll entertain a motion to approve or deny. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that application A20-6.7, 17 Fritz Place, be approved. Motion made and seconded. Second. Okay. Oh, there's a discussion. Nick, Nick is this um, I'd like to uh, suggest two conditions. Okay. One is that the side by the river be four inches higher. The side of the swale by the river be four inches higher than the opposite side. And the other thing is just to, to wrap the silt fence around the end of the swale. I noticed it's not wrapped around the end of the swale. Okay. You would write a second? No, that's fine. Uh, yeah, I, I withdraw. withdraw your second. Yeah. You withdraw your motion? Yes, I withdraw the motion. Now you're going to make a new motion? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that application A20-6.7, 17 Fritz Place, be approved with two conditions, that the uh, side of the swale by the river be four inches higher and a silt fence be wrapped around the side of the swale. Motion made, seconded. Second. Motion made and seconded. Uh, any other discussion? All for a vote. Ellie? Yes. Nick? Yes. Deb? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. Yes. Okay. I think you're all set now. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming back, straightening that little detail out. Okay. Um, I'm not going to get into Tully's Road just at this time. Let's see. Uh, a27.7, this was a stream bank disturbance. Um, Aaron and I had a discussion and it, uh, it uh, went for administration approval. Correct, Aaron? I'm sorry, A27.7? Yes. 7, 79 Kondraki Lane, yes. Okay, A28.2, 1193 Durham Road, this was a shed. It was also approved administratively. Yes. Okay. Now, uh, coming back on new applications, I'd like to get take care of number five under new applications, A20-10-2, 
10.35 Research Parkway. Good evening. Good evening. Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission, my name is Tom Cody. I'm an attorney at the firm of Robinson and Cole, and I represent the applicant, Montanti Construction. And um, very simply, um, we're asking that the Commission set a public hearing for the application at your next meeting. Um, we, you know, this, this property was the subject of a previous application. A public hearing was held for that. And we thought that this is in the public interest. And even though you haven't yet made a determination as to whether it is or is not a significant activity, we thought it would be appropriate and we would respectfully ask that a public hearing be scheduled for your next meeting. Okay, that's a little on the push, but hasn't been heard of. But the, there's a difference between a public hearing for significant activity and a public uh, hearing for uh, public concerns. And Aaron wants, and Aaron indicates that the previous application was a public hearing as for a significant activity. And I don't want, excuse me, I don't want to underrate the site until we get a chance to review the plan. Now, if you want to treat it as a significant activity for a public hearing, um, it's probably a little bit of a push, but I suppose we could do it. Are they... Do they know the requirements for a public hearing? For what a significant activity? For a well, significant I'm... activity? I'm sure Attorney Cody is familiar with the requirements. Um, I, I, I would point out one more thing with the other, if it's just a public hearing f due to public interest, they're only required to send certified letters to the abutters. If it's a public hearing due to a significant impact activity, they're required to send notice to everyone within 100 feet around the property. So there's that, that difference as well. Well, what other difference is it? Well, nothing, well, there's a lot when it comes to a significant impact activity. When you declare a significant impact activity, typically you, you announce, you state why it, it is significant impact. Um, area being disturbed, impact to the river, or what a bridge situation, whatever it is. All right. Um, and then the other thing is, is it requires significant impacts, require eight reports, um, and anything, other information at the discretion of the commission that is required to be prepared. This application already has done a lot of that work. Tonight I handed out the wetland report that they prepared, the soil report that they prepared, geotechnical report, as well as the, the large plants set. So for them it wouldn't be a, they would still maybe have more work to do under that but they've done at least, I mean, more than half the work under significant impact activity. Well, uh, e even though we had a public hearing left for the last application, uh, it was for significant activity, and this is a large tract of land, 165 acres or so. Um, I, I don't want to sh cut this property short. And there are issues downstream not, not caused by Bristol-Myers or not caused by anything more than development over the years that uh, people should be able to be, have some concerns about. So basically, if you're looking for a public hearing regarding the public concern, I would say not until we look at it next month and then we'll schedule it for December. Um. If we proceeded with the assumption that it is going to be deemed a significant activity. Insignificant or no, significant? No, significant. I love these. I know, I know. Um, if we did proceed with that assumption, would the commission be able to schedule that for the November 4th meeting? It's, it's, it, I'm not saying yes or no at the moment. All I'm telling you is that for some reason, everybody woke up after the COVID, and they're back with applications that had, they've waited six months or a year to submit. So we're getting loaded up for, with some couple of heavy items uh, for the next meeting. 
but that doesn't mean you're not entitled to your day in court, so to speak. Aaron? There's two ways they could do that. One is they self-declare as a significant impact activity right now and, and submit a check to me soon uh, for the extra fee. There's an extra $375 fee. And the other way to do it is that the commission declares it's a significant impact activity. Well, no, they're, they're, ready, to su they're ready to submit a significant activity request for a public Request a public hearing for a significant activity uh, application. They asked you, can you get, can it be done and put on the agenda for November? Yes, it could be done. It, it does. You, and you've got review time and you've got time to go over it. They, they want to no, be in no. your office. That's what I'm saying with the understanding that they've got to watch their statutory time frames, um, you know, because it, we would, ha we would probably end up tabling the public hearing, you know, if information isn't in yet or if reports aren't ready or so on. So with the understanding that they're, 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 they're pushing the statutory timeline. But I think they, I know they understand that, so. Uh, I think they do know the understanding and the fact that they want to get the ball rolling is just going to expedite it by a minimum of 30 days because you're going to get into a public hearing and you're going to have all the same questions, whether it's December or November, on that. But it's what she's saying, you could open the public hearing in November and not finish it till December or there beyond. We recognize so the, that. So the ball is in your court, significant Re activity or not? Yes, we, we recognize that the hearing may open in November and may need to be continued. Um, I think we're prepared to self-declare that's the, if that's the term, uh, that it would be considered a significant activity and we would proceed accordingly. Okay. Any commissioners, any questions? Nick? I'm just concerned, Aaron, that uh, the public hasn't seen what is in place there now. Not that it's hiding anything, but from what used to be there to what's there now is a complete different show as far as uh, the demolition and the site you're going to have a lot of people asking questions that are going to open their eyes are going to open when they see the lot up there because if you put it into a public uh, concern or public hearing aren't they going to be allowed to go on the site to see it no only if we have only if the commission takes a, a site visit altogether we went through this on the Tully's road project the, um, if the commission declares a special meeting to go out and have a site walk, which I, I encourage, um, then it's open to the public as well. If you go one by one to the site, it's not open to the public. So you're leading this into a public hearing where everybody's going to, we're going to go out there and everybody's going to go out there and see the site? Unless the commission doesn't want, either doesn't want to go out there because you've already I, think, I believe you, you went out there last, yeah, you all went out there last time. Maybe Jennifer didn't, she's new. Jennifer's our new member. Um, I don't know if, Eileen, were I you? There. You were there too. Okay, so you've seen the site. Maybe you don't need to go out to the site again. However, if you did want to go out again, there's two options. You go as a commission, and then, yes, it's open to the public. Any, any meeting you have is open to the public. If you could do what we just did on Tully's Road site, you went out one by one. And in, in that case, no, it's not open to the public. All right, my, con my concern is that we're gonna have a room full of people here, the surrounding neighbors, with all sorts of questions when we go into a, a, a site walk on it, if we go as a group. Only because they haven't seen it since the demolition went down. So there's gonna be thousands of questions about the this piles that are there and, and what's actually happened out there wasn't there before. So we're going to have a lot of answers, a lot of questions being asked that we have to answer with this public concern if we do it and, and go into a significant activity where we need to go out and look at the site, unless we do it on a one-to-one -one basis is what you're saying, right? Correct. But it's a, a public hearing is a public hearing. You know, we would have a public hearing for a significant impact or for the reason that Attorney Cody wanted it, which is, is public interest. It's the same public hearing. Okay. The way it's conducted is the same. 
you ask for more reports with a significant impact activity, it's more technical information might be required. I was always under the assumption that it, uh, the public interest or the public uh, significant, activity. significant activity was to add input to the, what was going to go down out there, the project itself or the surrounding areas. We were all uh, history, no, we know the history out there. Um, and by the public coming in, they would put an input in to make this thing to resurrect any future problems it may have. Um, so I'm not sure you're, what, you, what you want to do is it says you know there's going to be problems after construction, or I'm just I'm dazzled by why you want to do this. Well, the, the, the reason is we would like to, first of all, get the process started. We expect that the public will be interested. And so by starting the public hearing, we're going to be sending public notice out very soon. And that will alert people to the fact that there will be a hearing and they can come and listen to the presentation, ask questions if they have them or make comments. Um, we think we have a very strong application. It is, just briefly, it is scaled back from the last application you saw. Um, and we think that there aren't going to be any, there are not going to be issues after construction that would be a problem. Nevertheless, it is a large site. The chairman said that right off the top of, of the meeting. It's a, it's a large site, and for that reason, there's significant amount of work in the Upland Review area. No direct impacts, but there is a significant amount of work in the Upland Review area. All right, so, so you're willing to accept the fact that if 60 people come that night and they all want to go out there and, and do a site walk, you, you may be challenged to let them go out there? We're, we would be happy to be a part of scheduling a site visit if the commission wants to do that. Okay. Allie? Uh, just usually we get the presentation beforehand here before we... We've had public hearings in the past, but it gives uh, the public a chance to review the whole thing and come up with, you know, uh, relatable questions. Well, hang on, hang on to that sound a minute. Deb? Yeah, um, since it was just handed out tonight, I, you know, haven't had a chance to look at it. Jen? Yeah, I, I haven't had a chance to look at it, and I haven't even been on the site yet, so. Okay, let me... Let me I just want to make one more comment, if I may. I, I'm sitting here, and I remember we had three nights of public... The, the public hearing went three nights. And I was just going to warn them, that could very well happen again. Right, but I think that's what they're trying to avoid. They wanna, they're well, trying to push you know, it maybe into two nights. Maybe that's what's... Well, whatever they're trying to avoid, it'll, whatever happens, happens. But one thing decent, one thing that's going to happen with this public hearing, as compared with us opening the meeting next month, and then determine the public hearing is necessary for whatever reason, and then they notify the people. This way, the people are going to be notified right up front. Within two weeks, everybody's going to be notified yes. where if we, went, if we didn't have the public hearing coming, it would be uh, a month or a month and two weeks before they got all notified. So we're having... the. the for them to go through the presentation and then we determine the public hearing is necessary, it's going to be the same thing. The, the, the difference is going to be, I can see the public hearing lasting more than one meeting. You, you hit... Now, I'm going to just, I don't want to say warn you, but you've got to keep in mind that this is a wetlands commission. So even though your project is downsized, it's not... You've got to prove to us that it's downside environmentally, not downside uh, industrially or commercially. Don't give us uh, 100,000 less square feet and say that it's, it's downsized. This all comes down to the impact to the wetlands, the, the flows, the, the drainage, the retention ponds, and, and those issues. So uh, the presentation, and I say this to many people, it's a wetlands presentation not a planning and zoning presentation. Okay? Yes, sir. I will mention something else. I was thinking last time, you know, we had a visual, we had a PowerPoint on the screen behind you, but I'm thinking because of COVID, 
we probably wouldn't be able to have it in the auditorium or may not be able to have it in the auditorium where everyone's sitting six feet apart. So that would trigger another place. There are other places in town, but that you'd have to put that on your notice. We, we've got to, if this goes ahead, we have to talk to put that on your notice. It's not going to oh. be here. Well, okay. How do you want them to note it to get back to you to determine this public hearing is somewhere else? Well, we have How many people can, days. first of all, this place support? That hasn't been figured out yet? Well, every six feet, count a chair. I don't know if it's six feet, every other row. I mean, you've got to determine how many people can fit in here for COVID. Then maybe their notice going out has to send uh, a request form to Aaron or someone. Do you tend to, to are, are you planning well, to attend the public hearing well, and mm. send the notice back? Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, she's got a valid point, but I, I'm not so sure how many places this can handle and go from there. I think we can, we can work it out. Yeah. I don't think people have to commit. I don't think that's fair to ask the public to commit. Well, to how something. are you, Aaron, if 1,400 people come walking in the door, what are you going to do with them? We'll have to put it in the biggest auditorium we have in town. What, what, what are we all going to pack Oakdale. up and drive to it? <laughs> Oakdale is 5,000 seats. Fine. But you're going to wait until the night of the meeting to determine that? No, I don't know. It's a logistical problem. We'll have to work it out. That's why I think it should be on the, the notice to the public to, do you plan to attend or not? Because of seating, COVID seating, do you plan to attend? An so RSVP. Just an indicator. So you an have RSVP. an indicator. Maybe an indicator. Yeah. You're not, you're not committing anybody to anything. We can't exclude anybody, though. That was my, my concern. You know, that's an interesting question. Um, can you limit the first 100 people to the meeting? You go... To, You've got your connection upstairs, or on this upstairs, to find out. Can you limit this meeting to 100 people? First 100 people comes and get through the door. After that, public's out. I can inquire. Yep. All the good questions. We all set? Um, so is the commission of a mind to schedule the hearing for the fourth? I think the, the condition is to schedule hearing, providing you confirm that this is a, a request for a public hearing for a significant act activity and, the, and whatever goes along with it. Okay. okay. We will follow up with something in writing to Erin. Uh, I think it's called a check she sent. Okay. And she needs a check fee. But no, you're going to give the presentation at the public hearing. You're hearing the same presentation exactly. you're going to give uh, to exactly. the regular meeting. and, and uh, It's exactly our concern is, is, is going through multiple versions of that, and we don't want the public to feel that they may have missed something at, a, at an earlier meeting. So we're, we're ready to... Well, my suggestion is you want to stay close to Aaron in the next 30 days to get any input on this thing resolved, because... One thing we're not going to do here is to review the application as you would have reviewed it in her office. Okay, it's not going to be a, 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 well, what about this and what about that? No, you're going to resolve those things in her office before they come up to us on that. Okay. Understood. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Okay. We need a motion. I don't think we need a motion for the hearing. Just uh, they're volunteering the, the information. And you got in and out fairly quickly. And I appreciate you taking us out of order. Okay. All right. Now, I think jumping back into old business is uh, application 827.1, 5 and 21 Tully's Road. Mr. Chairman, could, could we have a five-minute recess? Uh, yeah, I think you, you got, okay, the staff request.
requested a five minute recess, so let's shut down for five minutes. Okay, all right. All right, we're dealing with application A27.1, Tully's Road in Wartonbrook. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioners. Um, thank you, uh, Planner O'Hare, uh, for your time this evening. Um, this is the uh, second meeting. Um, for this subject project. Uh, my name is Lucas Hullerich. I'm the engineer for the project. I work for Woodard and Curran, based in uh, 213 Court Street, uh, Middletown, Connecticut. And uh, for, for this uh, particular meeting, uh, we'd like to present uh, an update of the activity since the last meeting. And uh, listen to any further questions or comments uh, that might be raised uh, from, from the commission. Um, if, if we think about the last meeting and the purpose of this project, uh, it's, it's really focused on a, an environmental remediation project uh, which is being required by the Connecticut Deep uh, Remediation Division. It's to uh, remediate uh, nickel impacted soil within a wetland uh, and following that remediation, the wetland is to be restored. Uh, this would improve the quality of the wetland, um, as we described in detail during the last meeting. Uh, we have multiple agencies involved with the review of the project. Uh, we talked about this at the last meeting, um, Army Corps, Connecticut Deep, US EPA. Uh, in terms of some updates from the last meeting, uh, we conducted uh, five site walks with commissioners. And during those site walks, uh, we reviewed site conditions, we reviewed the project, uh, we, talk, we discussed various topics, uh, answered some questions uh, during those site walks. Um, a few of those topics, which we also included in our application and the response to comments from the earlier uh, letters that we received in August, uh, some of those topics included uh, tree preservation uh, that we're proposing for the project, uh, the benefits of that tree preservation in terms of uh, mitigating erosion potential, uh, assisting with the restoration of the wetland itself following the work. Uh, we discussed sequencing of the excavation in terms of performing that excavation in cells to, again, um, mitigate uh, the potential for uh, significant erosion during that project. Um, once those excavations are performed in cells, they would be backfilled in cells as well, very quickly after the excavation. Uh, we talked about the use of the term bank run gravel. Uh, it's an industry term and the intention was not to specify that gravel would be used as backfill, uh, a fine sandy loam soil, which is similar to what is already present at the site, would be used as a backfill, uh, overla overlain by an organic wetland soil at the shallower depths. Uh, we discussed the erosion and sedimentation control measures uh, that were included in our plan, and we talked about those during the last meeting in, in significant detail. Uh, those included silt fence, uh, straw, uh, straw bales, um, the use of straw wattles, uh, the use of um, diversion, temporary diversion of stormwater inputs into the excavation area, into the work area, surrounding that temporary uh, outfall with erosion and sedimentation controls, 
Uh, we talked about the contingencies that would be employed uh, should, should there be a significant rainfall, for example, and what some of those contingencies are. Uh, we talked about flood mitigation. Uh, we focused uh, quite a bit of uh, time for some of the site walks in, in one particular area of the site, and I'll just walk to the map if I may, just to point that out. Just remember to use the microphone. So there's a, a portion of the site which is in the uh, southwestern portion of the area. Um, it is the area that is closest to Wharton Brook. And prior to the site walks being performed, I installed uh, some wooden stakes along the edge of excavation uh, in this particular area of, of the site so that uh, commissioners and the environmental planner uh, during one of the site walks could kind of visualize for themselves uh, the proximity of that excavation to the brook. Uh, the excavation does not encounter the brook itself. Um, it is in an area where there is uh, a zone of higher topography on both the west, eastern and western sides. And there is a lower, a lower uh, elevation in between those two um, higher areas. And that's, that's an area that uh, we focus some proactive attention to in terms of uh, proactively installing flood mitigation measures. And we described those in the last meeting as well. Mr. Chairman, sh can I ask for clarifications or should I wait? No. You, you, Go ahead, Aaron. On that last point, Lucas. Yes. Um, you are on the map. There is work to be conducted below the ordinary high water mark. Correct, but as we've so that ordinary high water mark is not the edge of the brook. The ordinary high water mark is uh, an Army Corps term that defines. Um, events where higher water could be present. Yes, but there's a reason they have you put it on the map. It's the higher level, the, uh, the average maybe for the year of where that river would be. It doesn't, obviously doesn't reflect where the flood level would be because that's way up, way up the slope. So it's, it's the average water level in a year, I guess, I mean, we could read the definition, but it, it's, it's in the water. Like right now, we're in a drought, as I pointed out to you when we were at the site. This, we're in, the state's in a drought. So that water level's going to come up, usually comes up in November, pops up. And it'll be probably, I'm guessing, at that ordinary high water mark that is depicted on the map. So that would be, there'd be 110 feet of activity in inside the river, inside the ordinary high water mark. It wouldn't be the river today. It wouldn't be in the flowing water today. But in the winter, it would be. For that, just for that 110 feet in the west side. That's, that's if the water does come up into that area, is what you're saying. Because right now, it's not there. Well, let's, let's back up. Where did you get the ordinary high water mark that you put on the plan? That was a, that was a mark that was, uh, that was a mark that was designated by um, our soil scientists for the project. It was a request by Army Corps to identify that mark. Right. Because if you do a project in the summer, the water level is going to be different than if you do a project in the winter. That's, that's why that designation is important. And the same thing with the bank around gravel. You're confusing me because I thought we talked, I thought you might be bringing a sample tonight of the bank. You said I'll bring a sample of the bank run gravel. 
That, that was actually a, a talking point that I had here when I reviewed your environmental planner's report, which states that I would have brought that sample. Um, I don't remember saying that, and i did pretty sure I did not say that, um, that I would bring a sample of soil to this meeting. Oh, okay, that's what I thought. And, and when we talk about it out there, we use the term bank run gravel. I mean, you didn't correct me. I mean, you said, and you said it last time at the meeting, that this bank run gravel has a significant amount of sand in it, in your experience, in the past, that it does, it just does. I personally, I don't know how the commission feels, but I personally like to see this bank run gravel and by the way, I had a conversation with the EPA on two, um, Tuesday, yesterday, and the bank run gravel came up because that's what they thought was going to be deposited there. The EPA had some concerns about it. I mean, I did too because, I, I mean, one could say, he said, it's not what's there today, but he said one could make the argument that it provides more stability than what's there today. So you're, you're renovating the whole area, so maybe you do want to put in something that's more stable. But it's, to be clear, it's not the same as what's there today. So if you want to make it more stable, that's one thing. If you want to replicate what's there today, that's another thing. Point taken. Aaron, how do you know what's there today? Um, just from digging about, and there's, there's several trees that got blown over in storms, let's say. Right. And they're all up like this, and you can see there, I, there's a word for that, that, that big hole that's left after a tree goes up. I don't know what the name is, but there's a big depression. Right. And so that's the dirt that's under. So you don't even have to dig, you see it. And I took my trowel and dug in there, and it's that red, fine sand. Some of it was more coarse. It was solid, same color, like almost the color of this table. And then it did have, I thought it was all sand, but it went like this, and then some round pebbles appeared, like the size of my thumbnail, like a little smaller than marbles. And so it does have some of that material in it. But I don't know, I'm not in this business, but I wouldn't call it gravel. I mean, I'm not in the stone business. I wouldn't. I, Gravel implies, it has implications, and you work in that business, Nick, maybe you know what gravel is in the, in the industrial term of the word gravel, in the uh, industry. The word bank rod gravel is um, a word, a term that's used, and um, it's notorious along the Quinnipiac River. Um, there's layers, there's a topsoil layer, maybe it's 200 years old, and then below that, there's, there's a gravel level with, with an assortment sizes of gravel. You can get gravel over at the airport area, which is four to five inches of diameter. You can go to my house, which is right on the Quinnipiac River, and you can get a, a half, three-quarter inch side bank run gravel, which has no stability to it. And I bet if you took a shovel out there and dug down, got rid of the 100-year layer that's there, which the trees are growing and thriving on, Underneath that, there is, is a bank run gravel, if it hasn't been already removed, because I believe that whole corridor from Susio's right up to uh, the railroad tracks was mined over the last 50 or 60 years. They took sand and gravel out of that. Um, it, it comes in layers. Like you can find it right on Colony Street, right in Wallingford. You have the same predicament where, um, where the Ellsville Funeral Home is. Uh, I did some work there, and if you go down five feet, you had a nice layer of, of uh, I call peanut stone or bank run gravel. Underneath that, you had some nice beach sand. Um, so the word bank run gravel, is, is the definition has a large span to what it could be. Um, I don't believe his intention is to bring big boulders in to stabilize it so you can put a 100-ton truck on there. I think what he's calling bank run gravel is something that somewhere is already there, a fine find uh, sandy, stony material that's not compactable. It's, uh, it's going to replace what they take out, and it's going to fit right in with the environment that's there already. So, I mean, I saw areas that weeped out there in two spots that were weeped. If you dug into where the water was weeping out of the ground, I believe you'd find this gravel that he's talking about, the fine, meshy gravel um, with some sand deposits mixed with it. 
And then the other thing is, uh, Aaron, if you look at the history out there, a lot of Amatech, I believe, is sitting on fill. It was brought back up to grade so they could develop it. So the earthly soils that were out there have already been gone. They've already mined them away. So not that that adds a plus to this, but um, I think if you took a shovel or a spade, went out there and, and uh, dug in a couple of different areas, you'd find what we call bank run gravel because it's a sandy, gravelly, fine stone base. I think part of the term kind of uh, indicates that it's a, it's a virgin dig to, where you went into a bank and got this sandy gravel coming up as compared to a process or something else. It's kind well, of a virgin location, right? In addition, I wanted to say that my comments were not just based on what I saw in the field. They have in so much material has been, uh, documents has been handed in. But in one of those documents, um, there's a chart of 52. They took samples at 32 sites, 32 locations. On that site? Yes. And what did you use to take samples with? Uh, we took a variety of tools, shovel, uh, core. No, no uh, excavator or anything. No excavator, no. No, these are hand, yeah. Uh, two, hand up dug. to two feet deep. And they have a chart of the 32 locations. That's where, if you, anyone can look at it, and only very few of them said the word gravel. These had the words clay. You know, different ones are different, but you know, it, it, there's a variety. I mean, I was struck with the variety across the two acres, if you look at that chart. There's some of fine sand, brown sand, black sand, um, gravel, a few gravel, um, medium coarse sand, medium to fine sand, brown sand, black sand, um, clay, silt. There was a mixture. So it's just, if... So what's the harm putting a mixture back? They're not proposing to do that. They're proposing to put in the middle part, 12 inches of organic material. No. And then underneath it, 12 inches of bank run gravel. You put in 12 inches of organic material, topsoil? We had talked about putting 12 inches of organic material in the center, but that can, if, if it makes more sense to match what we're putting in the six inch excavation areas on the sides, to put six inches of topsoil in the center, that's something that could be considered as well. I, I would think that it wouldn't function uh, the same as it's functioning now. The topsoil would, would travel its way down, wouldn't let any uh, permeability go through it. I don't think that would be my choice. Well, you, the reports don't say topsoil, they say organic soil. Organic wetland soil to be similar to what's there already. Right, so what's you only found a half inch of organic soil. That was at one spot way down. Yeah, that was at a every spot place lower you dug, down. Yeah, but every place you dug, there was only a half inch or an inch. Yeah, that maybe oh. on the far. We didn't go on, uh, Mr. Chairman. We didn't go on the far east side. Maybe down there, it's it's deeper with the, the organic. I don't know. But when we what we saw, so people know what we're talking about is the it's it black and it's fibrous. It's kind of like flour. It's, it's fibrous black. You don't see it in the woods. I mean, usually it's atypical. This, I, I, I don't right. see it often. Okay, let's, let's move on because until you get... You're not going to determine what soil you're going to put back there at this point. You're going to determine what comes out and where, and where you're going to get the supply and does this supply match what's coming out? Well, I guess this was a discussion to have, meaning... We're not, if this is approved, do we really, is it really important to replicate exactly what's there? I mean, that's, that'd be a whole exercise in, okay, six, two inches over here, six inches over here, this over here, or is it just good enough to make a uniform site? Well, we try, it's good enough. Or are you trying really to, to really recreate what's there? It's two different exercises. Yeah, but what, when you're saying it's good enough, doesn't mean that it's bad. You're trying to say that if you don't have a teaspoon of this here and a tablespoon of that there, it's not permissible? Don't say the words, is this good enough? Well, this is one of my com the comments. Um, I said it in the environmental planners report that you went out Friday night. 
but also tonight I handed out comments. I, I don't, what I'm saying is their approach, which is a typical approach, is uniformity. They put in 12 inches of bank run gravel in the middle, then 12 inches of organic matter. On the two sides, east and west, they put in um, six inches of sand followed by six inches of, or, uh, no, no, I'm sorry, just six inches of organic matter. Is that correct on the two uh, sides? Where we're removing six inches, yes. You're putting six inches of organic back in? Organic material on, on the two sides to provide a substrate for plants and seeds to actually grow. A lot of those plants like to grow in the sand that's there. It's, it's a high nutrition material. It's going to be similar to what's there. You know, it's, by organic material, he's talking about 100 years of uh, debris that's laid on the like ground. topsoil. Yeah, well. It's going to be a topsoil, man. Basically. Uh, well, this organic is. Organic containing topsoil, yeah. Uh, uh, just, just <laughs> may, may I just uh, clarify one point? Um, you said that this is a typical approach, a uniform approach, and um, I mean, we spent, we spent time uh, with you last December, first talking about the project, which was very helpful. Um, we tried to address your concerns regarding erosion, tree removal, and we incorporated that into the project. And um, I, I think we, we, we tried to make the project such that it would address some of the concerns that were brought up. Um, and we, we tried to think about, uh, you know, tree, uh, preservation as well. Um, try to think about topography that's out there as well. Um, so I just wanted to add that as a point of clarification. So I'm, I'm still on updates from the last meeting. Uh, may I? Go ahead. Unless you, Aaron, no, unless you wanted, okay. Uh, so we, we also talked about some other um, uh, topics during the site walks. We talk, talked about the restoration planning that we had incorporated into the project, um, uh, invasive species removal and control. There's, there's a, large, a large portion of the central ex, uh, proposed excavation area is uh, dominated by invasive species. Uh, we talked about the robust monitoring plan that is also proposed following the work. And uh, another topic that we discussed too was just the timing of the project. Uh, being as we're in drought conditions right now, um, it is good timing to perform a project like this uh, in close proximity to Wartonbrook. Um, we did submit revised plans prior to the last meeting. Uh, we submitted two sets of responses to comments before the last meeting. Uh, we've had some additional coordination with Army Corps. We're still awaiting Army Corps' uh, permit approval. Um, at, the last at the last meeting, there was uh, some discussion about uh, a public hearing uh, commission at that time uh, felt it was not necessary and um, thought that a peer review could be performed. Uh, and uh, uh, as part of that discussion regarding the peer review, uh, it seemed like that peer review would be focused on engineering aspects and not on a regulatory review, uh, given that the regulatory requirement has already been determined by Connecticut Deep in terms of the remediation requirement. Um, and I guess a, a question I would ask at, at this time is, uh, given, given the review by the other agencies that are involved, uh, the site walks that have been conducted, uh, five site walks, uh, just like to ask if the commission can just confirm if, if there are still some outstanding concerns that um, would necessitate the peer review as it pertains to the engineering aspects of the project. Well, we're, we're interested in the peer review uh, report, but that's not available at the time. And is that still in, on, the, on the, the uh, table? That's still coming? Yes, we're waiting for the applicant, Pfizer, to agree to um, cover the cost of the peer review. So the peer review scope of work is all set. They're all set to go, but they have, they're waiting for the green light and that involves the uh, cost, which is $7,500. And you're still waiting for EPA reports and, and Army Corps reports? Uh, we're waiting for the Army Corps Army to Corps. issue their permit. And you've been in contact with Army Corps? Y yes, um, 
very briefly two months ago, and then we had a, a good discussion that, um, yesterday, a virtual phone conference, yeah. With, with Army Corps? With a representative from Army Corps and, and a representative from so, EPA. So we're, ba we're basically waiting for all this stuff to come together, the reports. You still have a lot of questions for him, I, I gather? I do. I, I handed out um, my third set of comments was handed out tonight. Lucas just got his um, tonight as well. Um, it's very, they're very technical, most of them. I mean, it runs the gamut, you know, from big concerns like, and maybe I'd like Lucas to, that the FEMA information was from 2010 and we are now using 2017 FEMA information. So how much has it changed? What's, what's the difference? Well, maybe Lucas took a look at that. I took a look, look at it in the office and it seemed like it went up. The flood weight went up the slope, but did you get a chance to look at it? Um, well, I, I, I took a look at that and the floodplain actually comes closer to Wharton Brook uh, from what's shown on, in 2010. Um, I, I can't comment specifically because I haven't seen the, the comment that you have in this document regarding that. Well, you've, there's, there's a lot of things that you have pointed out that are, we'll say, a technical matter. Uh, uh, SEMA, or FEMA elevations in this report and, and somebody else's notations. I think you've got to work with, with uh, Lucas as far as getting that straightened out. But as far as us tonight sitting here listening to whether it's whether FEMA is, is here or there, you got to get it on the map and see how it affects or what changes it. I don't think, I don't know what this commission is looking to do tonight, especially without the uh, uh, third-party review report. Well, one, well, yes, but one thing that I'm still frustrated with, uh, I'm still asking for flood control inform, information or, or... What kind of control? I'm still asking for how the applicant intends to control the site during a theoretical flood event or a large storm event or a hurricane. I've been asking for that for a while. I don't have it yet. And if, if we could get it, then the peer reviewer could review it. Right now, I know what the peer reviewer is going to say. He's going to say, there's, not an, there's nothing for flood control. We need something to, to grab onto. So that, if they could get on that, that would, that would help, because I don't want the peer reviewer to come back and say, where is it? Is, is that, is that um, question or concern, is that included in this document that you handed tonight? It's included in every document I've ever written. The three, the three comment documents. I've asked for a flood contingency report. Right. Finally, on August 27th, I got a contingency report, but it's an, it talks all about erosion control. It talks about erosion control during regular times. Right, but ju just to clarify though, we do have flood contingency, flood measures along that portion uh, near Wharton Brook. And we also included in that contingency plan discussion about um, uh, monitoring weather, responding to events, um, having additional uh, devices on site, um, Maybe it's, maybe it's the structure of the report, or um, maybe you're seeking some additional details, but, um, and I thought we had responded to those previous comments, um, but in this document, you, you do have some comments regarding that, specifically, and what you handed out this evening? Yes, some more, but... I, I just want to make sure that I can respond to your comments, or we can respond to your comments and make sure that they're in here. Yes, but I'm, I don't know enough about flood control. I wish I did. That's why we're yeah. seeking the Milona McBroom, to talk about actual flood, not just measures, not just devices like sandbags. I mean, I said to the EPA, you know, can we put sandbags out there? I mean, I thought it was a good idea, but what do I know? So I need something I can grab onto. Also, it's not just the physical measures, but what if we do get a flood? What happens then and who? I, I want the, the applicant to take responsibility for the cleanup from 
a, what's called a scour event. If a flood comes, it scours out an area that because the trees, the tree roots and the, and the, tree, the shrubs and the ferns and all that, their roots are holding that sand together. If you clear those out, or when you clear those out, and a flood comes through, there's nothing to hold that sand in there. I mean, a few of those big trees will be there, but basically most of it's gone. So then it's scoured out. What happens then? I want you to address, okay, wh what happens? In, it's theoretical, I understand it's theoretical, but what happens? Who cleans it up? How do you, do you run out there? Is there anything you could do beforehand? Or is it just one of the acts of nature, it gets taken down the river into the Quinnipiac and into Long Island Sound? Is it just one of those acts of nature? If it is, then who, who restores the site afterwards? What are the plans for restoration? And, and you know, I understand there's gonna have to be bonding for all this. this. This permit would have to be bonded. So we have to look at these eventualities or possibilities. And it's, you know, it's not just theoretical. I've seen the, the 100 year flood five times in this town in, I've been here 15 and a half years, where the Quinnipiac was over 150, over Route 68. And did you find any scouring along the Quinnipiac? Because I think in this flooding of this site, it's gonna come from the Quinnipiac back. That well, that's- The whole area, I've seen that whole area along the parkway with three, four feet of water in it. But to get scouring, you need velocity and you need pitch. You don't, in this sand down there, you're gonna fill, you're gonna fill the area and, and if he's got, a, let's say he's got one of his pits open, I think the pit's gonna be first. You're not gonna have the velocity coming out of Wharton Brook. You're gonna have the river flowing back and meeting Wharton Brook somewhere on the other side of Amitai. That's true. At the FedEx site, we actually saw yeah, it's that. It's going to come back. So, you know, you talk about scouring, and I, I just don't see that on this site. You've got the same elevation as the Quinnipiac. The Quinnipiac is going to flood. The flood and the flood's going to go this way. Yeah, it's all moving, but it doesn't have the velocity on the base of the, of the uh, uh, floodplain. And may, now, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe your engineers can prove me wrong. But that's how I see it, that you're not going to get the scouring in this area. I know what I saw on the FedEx site, which is basically the next site downriver, is um, I didn't witness any hurricanes or anything, but I did see f where they had discharged stormwater into it, into the upland. It came and it carved out a channel deep channel and it kept on going because nothing was going to stop that fine sand from from leaving. Okay, but that's that again is is a single point discharge coming off of a paved parking lot. Right. This is coming from uh, Quinnipiac Brook that takes in, I don't know, thousands of acres and comes in at, at a, the elevation of the river. You well, don't have a single point in, influx. No, but if they when they open it up. But so, they're they're going to open up a small section at a time. We talked about this yesterday out there. They're going to do an area, restore it, and then move on to the next area. This is going to be clear the whole site and then come in and start putting uh, organic material in. He's got it sectioned on his print how they're going to do it in the areas they're going to work themselves out to. And it's, it's a small, they're small plots. It's not going to be a two acre clear me and, and, and then bring this stuff in and fix it. This is different than regular construction work. This is going to be done in sections. There's an area, and to the, when you go down in there to the left, it's uh, weeping real, it's, I mean, you can almost see the water bubbling out of the ground. I asked him, how is he going to attend to that? They're going to drain, they're going to remove the soils, and if the water, there's a spring there, they're going to dress it to go over to the little feeder brook that's at the end of the project, and then when they restore it, they're going to leave it back to the mushy, marshy, what was there to begin with, but they need to get that top six inches of nickeled soil out of there. I mean, it's not, you, you make it sound like he's gonna go in with the bulldozer or, or with 25 guys tomorrow and clear the whole place, he is not. They're gonna stabilize along the uh, Wharton Brook area, they're gonna stabilize that, and then they're gonna work either from the left or the right to the middle and then back themselves out. They wanna do the six inch areas first and then the two foot areas only because of concern that maybe there will be a, a, a minor flood or a thunderstorm or whatever is going to cause uh, 
havoc on it. And I'm sure they're responsible for restoring what's damaged if, in their project. I'm sure they're, they're going to take the responsibility of fixing what gets broke while they're there. They're not going to just let it get washed out or washed away and walk away from it. Do you understand that they're going to do this in sections, Aaron? It's not going to be a, a, a scam over the, the whole area? I, I've heard that. I haven't seen a drawing of cells. Is there a drawing that shows cells? I don't have a drawing that lists out individual excavation cells, but we did, it, we did address that in the documents that we submitted discussing that it would be done in cells um, not to open up the entire site. Yes. And I can, I can confirm with uh, Commissioner Kern regarding um, stabilizing the work area first and doing the work in cells. This isn't going to be an educational project. These people were hired because they'd done this before. And from all the quizzing I did with him yesterday, he seems like he's on, on as a game with this. It's not his first, uh, first project. So I think he's got everything covered from my aspect. I believe he has everything covered. But Mother Nature, he doesn't have Mother Nature covered. So, But I believe he's ready for Mother Nature if she, she does something stupid. And I just, the point of a permit is not just to approve a practical plan, but is to, it is to also make room for eventualities and to consider and address eventualities, even if they never come up. You have to think what might happen, and then you address that within a permit to kind of rein it in, to get, to make sure it's, not, it's addressed. And what I'm thinking of, in, I don't know if you know, in April, we got 48 inches, this April, we got 48 inches of rain. The average rainfall for Connecticut is 47 inches. So in the month of April, we exceeded that. That's what I'm talking about. Like, what if this is open up and we have another April 2020? I just want to, I would like it to be planned for. That's all, that's all I'm saying is, once it's, once it's happening, it's very hard to hold back the water. Ellie? Uh, going back to soils. Anything you want to no, talk about? No, the, the site's not pristine. So you know, even if they don't replicate what's there right now, it may be an improvement to put back more organic material than, than is right there right now. Deb? No questions. Jennifer? Uh, after this project is all over, what does it look like um, as far as uh, monitoring the area? What, what does that look like? Monitoring it, um, reporting on what's being monitored. Will there be more <clears throat> soil sampling? Um, if something goes wrong um, after the project is completed, who's responsible for remediating that? What does that, all, that whole thing look like? So as part of the, good, good question, so as part of the uh, submittal to Army Corps, um, that submittal included a restoration monitoring plan, and um, that plan allows for monitoring up to 10 years, and there's specific metrics that have to be met regarding um, uh, plant survivability over time, um, condition of, of the restored wetland. Um, so there's that plan in place, and it's required by the Army Corps. So that's one, one measure. Um, in terms of after the, after the um, physical work is performed, um, sedimentation erosion controls would need to be in place. Um, such that the site has stabilized. Uh, Pfizer is responsible for that. Um, in terms of the overall project, Pfizer is responsible for that, and they have to adhere to post-restoration conditions. Are they responsible 10 years? More than 10 years? What's the... So we, we submitted some uh, example uh, photographs uh, recently uh, to the Commission for consideration, and there were some example projects that were shown um, 
And I think one of the projects shows that within a single season, uh, there was good regrowth of uh, uh, wetland plantings, um, uh, primarily small plants. And there was another project that showed within, I think it was three years, um, I'd have to go back and look at the exact uh, uh, dates there. The, yes. That's it. Uh, and that showed how, how trees were surviving. Um, uh, and and those, that particular project had excavation performed in close proximity to trees very carefully. Will uh, Aaron get those reports, those reports on how, how the soil's doing, how's the brush is doing? The report submitted to Army Corps. So that, that's the other aspect too, is, is there are reports that have to be submitted to Army Corps. And um, uh, in terms of, of providing copies of those reports, um, I would have to look and do. I don't know if Aaron even yeah. wants those reports, but. Oh, it's, it's in some of my comments to have that, if this permit's approved, it would be, I would ask for it as a condition of approval to get those reports. Okay. I, I also would like to be able to go to a site, a floodplain that's been restored to see, with, to see what it would look like after five or 10 years. I don't know if this is a rep, the, the one in the photographs, these are excellent photographs. These went out in the packet um, last Friday night. They really give you a good sense of before and after and it kind of kind of looks like Wharton Brook. The only the difference you see is that there's it, it's very flat. Their floodplain is flat, and our this our site has a little more uh, slope to it. But this is it says southeastern Massachusetts. What t what town was this in? I would have to check with Kyle. He was the one that Kyle was with me at the last meeting. Yes. And he was the one that um, worked on those two projects that are in that packet. So. I, w I would need to check with him. Because I, I would like to go see with my own eyes what it looks like after five years, 10 years. It doesn't have to be this site, just a similar site. Well, so uh, I guess getting back to the peer review, uh, uh, d does the commission does the commission wish that that peer review be done? I don't think we're going to vote on it until the peer review comes in. Okay. So, sounds like yes. Yeah. Okay. So, I guess right now I can provide verbal concurrence that uh, Pfizer will uh, fund the peer review, and um, uh, a written letter will be forthcoming early next week on that. So that that should help uh, with with. Uh, uh, aiding the commission in their review of the project. I would recommend you get some sort of engineer to predict what would happen if a hundred year flood came down to Quinnipiac and you had this site open. Somebody with some credentials other than us farmers that uh, have been playing in the dirt all their lives. Okay. All right, so I guess we'll see you next month. Do I have to request an extension at this time? I think time? you do. Well, it, it, it's, go ahead, Aaron. The, um, it's the commission, the way it works is the commission requests an extension of you. However, I think I explained this in the environmental planners report. Let's see if I, under recommendations, so that would be paid at the end. Recommendations. Okay. Let's see if I go into it then. All right, before, before I get into that, um, Mr. Chairman, I'm, <laughs> I'm asking that to be declared a significant impact activity, but if you don't wanna do that, then we march on ahead, I guess. Um, all right, so, a lot's happened in the last week, so you have to bear with me when I find this discussion about the uh, extension. 
Well, basically, just, if we request the extension, that takes care of whatever the state did or whatever they are allowed. Right. You can go through the formality of it requesting an extension, yes. However, just so everybody knows, the we're, I checked with the law department, and we're under Lamont's, uh, the governor's executive order, uh, order 71, I believe I could check that, that there is a 90-day extension granted to boards and commissions for any decision making or initiation of a public hearing. So normally in here you have to start your public hearing within 65 days. But I guess we're not starting a public hearing so that's moot right now. We would if, we, if it was a declared a significant impact activity. Okay, so we have plenty of time. The ordinary statute of limitations, you would have to act on this, on, you would have had to act at 65 days. Or that get, would have been September 20th. Or get an extension. Or get an extension. However, we did not get an extension in, at the September meeting, but we were under the executive order, so it's moot. So uh, this way, it gets us into December with the uh, executive order, so it's well, fine. Now, now, when in December? It, it would be enough to get us past the December 5th meeting, I think, is it December 5th, that meeting? Well, you just, you just put it on your calendar that we may need an extension in December. We may have to ask them for an extension in December. Okay. The total is 155 days. If you count our 65 days extension and the 90 that the governor's uh, executive order grants. So and then there's probably plenty, but just, right. just you know. Okay, until next month. Let's hope we can get that peer review in. And maybe you can find uh, somebody to give us a little more insight on what will happen if that flood comes down. Thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay. Very good. Okay. Uh, going into new business A16 7.3 Choate Rosemary Hall bond release. Yes, this is a $20,000 bond. Um, And everything is copacetic with the, with the site. I'm sorry, it's a thirty thousand dollar bond. So I'm I would suggest that the commission go ahead and uh, release the bond. I'll entertain a motion to release Joe Rosemary Hall's bond of thirty thousand dollars. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to make a motion that A sixteen seven point three three thirty three Christian Street, Choate Rosemary Hall, their request for a release of bond be approved. Second. Second. Motion made and second. Any discussion? All for a vote. Ellie? Yes. Nick? Yes. Deb? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, receipt of new applications. Uh, the first one, A29.1. Um, th this is a mi minor modification that Aaron discovered and it was really involved in trying to get the thing straightened out for winter time. Um, he didn't want to do some of the work until he's ready to, to plant grass. So uh, it, uh, we discussed it a couple of times and it was given administration approval. All right. Um, the Northrop Road A29.2 is the new lot for Northrop Road. A20 10.1 Church of Resurrection Building Edition. Anything special about that, Aaron? No. Okay. All right. A20 10.2, A711. I think this is next door to Sonic in that area by the parkway. Yes. Um, uh, it's a typo on the address if that's what you're looking at. It's 1033. Right. 1033. A10.35 Research Parkway, Muddy River. This is the, the Bristol Myers that we discussed. Okay. Um, discussion of proposal to adopt fines for violation. Let's hold that off just a minute. We'll come back. A notice of violation, old, uh, 1245 Old Colony, Quinnipiac. Anything new with that one? I, no. no. I'm waiting for the planning department to move forward with that. Okay, notice of violation 950 South Colony car wash. Uh, didn't we approve this last Yes, year? that was approved, but typically we hold it here until it's executed, what, 
what they're supposed to do. Okay. Uh, 822.1, 12 and 16 Northfield Road over, over clearing floodplain. He hasn't done any more. It's just where he hasn't done any more. He's, he's got another problem with the site, but he hasn't. He did demolish the old house, but the issue that he has to resolve that may or may not involve us that I just heard about today is he's, there's no sewer availability there, so he's got to put in a new septic system. Hmm. He's, in, he's in sandy soil down there. Uh, notice of violation 1152 Durham Road. You're just waiting for that to finish up? Um, that one, that I want to go out there one more time. The, the vegetation has grown in. I, I, maybe I'll ask him to remove his erosion controls. I want to go out there one more time. Okay, other than that, it's all set? Yeah. yeah. Is, is this, okay. Uh, all right, the report then falls into discussion of fines for violations. Your memo of last month, I think, or of August, uh, it talks about uh, different things. I don't know if they, uh, I don't know where we're going to go from. I don't know how to adjust the fines. Did you get a value? This, did you, where is this fine schedule? Did you generate this from Cheshire or North Haven or somewhere? $1,000? Well, I, the, the, well, up to $1,000, but fine schedule amount to be levied on a graduated basis. Now, where did you get this list? I want to say it's number five, one, two. Three. I made up the list. Oh, you made up the list? But I, the law department hasn't gotten back to me because they have to, the statute doesn't say, it says up to $1,000. It doesn't say per day or total. It, does, it, it was unclear on that point. Well, you've, you've got some other towns that have a fine schedule in place, right? Lots of them have a fine schedule. I, I haven't. Um, the, the law department was going to get that for me. Okay. So. I'd like to see what the fine is and then the dollar associated with it. Yeah. Instead of uh, 10 categories, maybe there's only five, you know, something like that. Okay? Okay. Anything else to come before us tonight? Not, I'll entertain a motion to approve. 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 <laughs> motion to adjourn. <laughs> Nick, you got me twice tonight. That's good. I approve of your adjournment. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to adjourn the meeting. Second. Second. Motion made to adjourn. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.